Can you name the names of some other corporations? For example, you write about Morgan Stanley. Not Morgan Stanley, but uh, but the uh, I mentioned uh, J.P. Morgan is a company that that in the past I've written about uh, the 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 role of J.P. Morgan in. Uh, uh, I did I did a story some years ago about uh, the, the sort of raised the question of of what what a bank, what are the responsibilities of a bank uh, when it finds itself wittingly or unwittingly involved in the financing of some enterprise or the transfer of funds related to enterprises that in hindsight today look very, very um, uh, suspect. Um, and so, but in terms of the companies that I write about in the book, there's Chattahoochee Brick, uh, uh, Captain English's enterprise, but he then, on the basis of that wealth, uh, he then founded a different bank in Atlanta, uh, which eventually became the, the largest financial institution, the most powerful financial institution in the South, and eventually was subsumed in the, into what is today Wachovia Bank. There was another great entrepreneur of Atlanta, equally important figure in the creation of the modern city, uh, who also relied heavily on this form of labor uh, in coal mines and iron ore mines. Uh, he founded a bank that is today SunTrust Bank. Uh, that bank and his other enterprises were instrumental in the creation of the modern Coca-Cola company. He had other enterprises uh, that became Georgia Power Company and Southern Company, which are two of the biggest uh, utilities in the Southern United States. In Alabama, U.S. Steel Corporation was the largest player uh, in operating mines where you had thousands and thousands of these forced laborers at work. Uh, and there are many other companies today uh, that in one manner or another have some sort of a connection, whether they know it or not. They have some connection back to these terrible events of, of 100 years US ago. U.S. Steel? U.S. Steel Corporation. And, and how was it, for instance, if someone was arrested on a vagrancy charge, you would assume that this was, would only be a, a very short sentence. How were they able to be then impressed into uh, service uh, for these companies for longer periods of time? Well, take, for instance, the example of a man named Green Cottenham, around whom I built much of the narrative of the book. Green Cottenham was a child of former slaves who was born in the 1880s in the center of Alabama. And by the time he had reached uh, adulthood, just after the turn of the century, this whole new system of intimidation, really terror in many respects, uh, had come into place against African Americans across the South. Uh, and he was arrested in the spring of 1908 uh, when a deputy sheriff in Columbiana, Alabama, uh, went out on a sweep, effectively, to round up a number of African American men, because a few days later, the man from the U.S. Steel Mine, who came by periodically periodically to pick up laborers and take them back to the mines uh, would be arriving in a few days. And so Green Cottenham was, was swept up. Uh, uh, he was, he was uh, standing around with a number of other African Americans behind the train station in the town. And this group of men were arrested for no particular reason. Uh, by the time they were brought before a judge two days later, the deputy couldn't remember exactly what the charge had been. And so the original charge that's written down on the day he's arrested is different from the one that the judge finally decides to convict him of, which was simply vagrancy. And almost any farm worker, and certainly any indigent African American man uh, in 1908, uh, could be charged with vagrancy unless he had some powerful white man willing to step forward and say, no, uh, I, he works for me, he's under my control. Well, that didn't happen for Green Cottenham, and so he is convicted of vagrancy. He was sentenced to a fine of $10 or thereabouts, but on top of the fines that would be imposed on these men, in those days, sheriffs and court clerks and many other government officials received their compensation not in salaries from the government, but from fees that were charged to the people they arrested and convicted. And so in addition to his fine, there, were, there was almost $200 of additional fees tacked on to what he would have to pay to become free. Well, that's two or three years' wages in that era. And that was something that would be impossible for a young man like him to have produced. And so to pay off those fines, he was effectively sold into the control of U.S. Steel Corporation, who would pay back his fines a month at a time. And this happened to thousands of people, many of whom 
even after their fines had then paid off, were still not released. Or the people who were holding them would invent another offense and make another claim of a, of a spurious crime, have them convicted again, and hold them for an even longer period of time. You say the system's final demise came with World War II. Explain why that was so significant. Well, at the beginning of World War II, just days after Pearl Harbor, uh, as President Roosevelt was mobilizing the national war effort, one of the issues that was being con um, discussed at the cabinet level in, in Washington were the propaganda vulnerabilities of the United States. What would be the issues um, that the enemies of America would, would raise uh, to try to undercut morale in the United States? And immediately, one of President Roosevelt's aides points out that, that particularly the Japanese were would argue that America was not the country fighting for freedom, and that the proof of that was the treatment of African Americans in the Deep South. Roosevelt realized what a vulnerability that was. He ordered that there be legislation against lynchings, making it a federal crime, uh, that that be introduced in Congress, which it was. And then, shortly after that, the attorney general was having a similar conversation with his deputies, one of whom said, by the way, there are also many places in the South where slaves are still being held, and it's been the policy of the federal government, of the Department of Justice, not to investigate, and this was the case for many decades, that the Department of Justice had a policy not to investigate allegations of slavery in the South and not to bring prosecutions against those who were holding slaves. But because of the propaganda concerns at the beginning of World War II, the, 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 the Attorney General issued a new policy which said, from this day forward, investigate these cases. And within a few months, there was an investigation and a prosecution underway against a family in Texas uh, which had been holding a man named Alfred Irving as a slave for many, many years under terrible circumstances. We've got five seconds. <laughs> and they were convicted and imprisoned the following year. And that's the technical end of slavery in America. Douglas Blackman, thanks so much for being with us. He's author of the book Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II. That does it for the broadcast. Democracy Now! produced by Sharifa Dokudus, Mike Burke, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.